As I mentioned in our previous presentation, the term carbohydrate is a fancy way of saying sugar. There are two classes of carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates, which are also called monosaccharides, and complex carbohydrates. Simply defined, monosaccharides are molecules that consist of just one sugar, such as glucose, fructose, which are shown here. Complex carbohydrates are basically just polymers composed of two or more sugars bonded together. One example is sucrose, shown here. Sucrose, which is actually table sugar, is actually composed of one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose bonded together. Because sucrose is made of two simple sugars, or monosaccharides, it is called a disaccharide. And yes, as indicated in this picture, you can separate sucrose into glucose and fructose by heating it with acid. Cellulose, which is a complex carbohydrate that is the major structural component of most plant matter, is a large polymer of glucose molecules bonded together. Cellulose is made up of way more than two glucose molecules, however. In fact, typical cellulose molecule is made up of about 3,000 glucose molecules all bonded together in a chain. Interestingly, you can separate cellulose uh, out into its individual glucose constituents also by reacting it with excess acid and probably a buttload of heat and time. Now I should point out to you that Huge polymers like cellulose are obviously not disaccharides because they're made up of way more than two individual sugars. To keep things simple then, we just call any carbohydrate polymer that's made up of ten or more sugars a polysaccharide. Any uh, complex carbohydrate that's got anywhere between three and ten sugars we call an oligosaccharide. Now simple sugars like glucose and fructose can be drawn in either an open chain fashion, which is what these structures here are, or in a cyclic fashion, which I'll explain later on. For now, let's just focus on this open chain way of drawing sugars. Just so you know, straight uh, chain sugars that have aldehydes on one end, like glucose or ribose shown here, are called aldoses. And straight chain sugars with ketones in them, like fructose shown here, or acetoheptalose shown here, are called ketoses. We can categorize these sugars further by giving them names that correspond to the number of carbons in their chains. For example, an aldohexose is a six-membered sugar that contains an aldehyde on one end. So glucose is indeed an aldohexose. An aldopentose is a five-membered sugar that contains an aldehyde on one end. Uh, fruit, uh, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, I guess ribose is an aldopentose. We also have ketohexoses, or a ketoheptose, for example. Fructose here is a ketohexose, because it's got a ketone in it, and it's got six carbons in its chain. And cetoheptalose is a ketoheptose. It's got seven carbons in its chain and has a ketone inside it. I'll now introduce you to a special concept called D and L notation, which requires you to know the following background. The simplest aldose on Earth is glyceraldehyde, whose two enantiomers are shown here. And yes, I am showing them as Fisher projections instead of as the traditional wedge and dash structures we've become accustomed to in the past. The enantiomer on the left is called D-glyceraldehyde because it happens to be dextrorotatory. That is, it rotates plane polarized light clockwise. The enantiomer on the right is called L-glyceraldehyde because it happens to be levorotatory. That is, it rotates plane polarized light counterclockwise. Now you might remember us talking about this light rotation concept called chirality back in chapter 5 last semester. I want to reiterate now what I did back then. There is no direct correlation between something being R or S and it being dextrorotatory and levorotatory. 
Some R compounds happen to be dextrorotatory, others happen to be levorotatory. The only thing that we can say for sure is that if one enantiomer of a compound is dextrorotatory, regardless of whether or not it's S or R, then the other enantiomer will be levorotatory and vice versa. Now just so you know, D-glyceraldehyde happens to have an R configuration and L-glyceraldehyde happens to have an S configuration. So as the field of carbohydrate chemistry developed, chemists began using this D versus L naming convention. And while we don't use this convention very frequently for other organic compounds, we use it a ton for carbohydrates. So how does the DL naming convention work? Well, here's how. When we draw a Fischer projection of a sugar, if the bottommost OH, which I've colored green in all of these examples here, is pointing to the right, then we say it's a D sugar. If the OH is pointing to the left, then it's considered an L sugar. That's pretty much it. It doesn't matter which direction the remaining OHs are pointing. All these other OHs up here doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if this bottommost OH here in green is pointing to the right, then it is a D sugar, and if it's pointing to the left, then it's an L sugar. And this all, of course, is, can only apply when we're drawing the open chain Fischer projection of the sugar. Now, I admit that this might seem a little confusing. If we look at D ribose, which I've shown right here, for example, we might be tempted to think that oh, it's a D sugar, so that means that it must rotate plane polarized light clockwise. In other words, it must be dextrorotatory. Oddly enough, that is not how the DL naming sugar works at all. Once again, here's how it does work. You look at the Fischer projection of the sugar, the open chain Fischer projection, and look at the bottommost OH, excluding the CH2OH. Bottommost OH, if it's pointing to the right, we say it's a D sugar, and if it's pointing to the left, we say it's an L sugar. Regardless of whether or not that particular sugar happens to be dextro or levorotatory, doesn't matter. So how did they come up with this crazy convention? Well, they just happened to notice that D glyceraldehyde, which is dextrorotatory, has its OH pointing to the right when you draw it in this Fischer projection. And uh, L-glyceraldehyde has its OH pointing to the left. They based the rest of the convention completely on that fact. Hence, every single sugar, when drawn in its open chain Fischer projection, follows that convention. The bottommost OH, if it's pointing to the right, is a D sugar, and if it's pointing to the left, it's an L sugar. And just in case you guys ever happen to be on a trivia show, you might be interested to know that almost all naturally occurring sugars happen to be D sugars. So, do you think you understand this concept? Let's take a look by throwing a few problems at you. First of all, I want you to categorize the following molecules as being D or L molecules. Let's take a look at this first one, three O's. Once again, I need to look at the bottom most uh, OH. I do not look at what's down here at the bottom, the CH3. I just look at the OH here uh, that's pointing to the right, and I notice it is pointing to the right. Because it's pointing to the right, it is a D molecule. Here's a more complex molecule. Once again, I do not look at the CH2OH. I just look at the OH coming off of here. What is it? It's pointing to the right. Therefore, it's a D molecule. Here's a Fischer projection of a simpler molecule. I look down here, there's only one OH, and it's pointing to the right. So once again, it is a D molecule. Now let's see if we can apply this to molecules that look less like a sugar. Look at this compound, R-valine, shown here in its Fischer projection form. Is it a D amino acid or an L amino acid? How in the world do we decide that? Well, there's no OH, but we can still categorize amino acids by looking at the direction that the amino group is pointing in the Fischer projection. So I ignore this CH3. I look over here and look at the NH3. This positively charged ammonium, is it pointing to the right or the left? Well, it's pointing to the right. So what is it? It is a D amino acid.